Everybody ready to uh, reconvene? This is tomorrow's. All right. There's some conversation going on about Lyme over here um, that I think is worth commenting on. Um, can, uh, traditionally, um, recommendations for Lyme are made for the purpose of raising pH. We talked about pH and solubility and the idea that the only way nutrients are available is when the pH is in a certain range. Um, and so what that means is that traditionally um, there's no distinction made between calcitic lime and dolomitic lime. Uh, one is calcium carbonate, one is calcium magnesium carbonate. Actually dolomitic lime, the calcium magnesium carbonate, um, is considered to have a, a higher liming index. So um, when all of the things are considered to be equal, it is recommended. Uh, conventionally, traditionally. Um, uh, one thing I didn't talk about with calcium and magnesium, this is part of the whole um, Albrecht analysis and definitely part of Reams's analysis, um, is that uh, calcium and magnesium are different. They are, you know, they've got different names. They have different effects. Uh, they have different size. Um, if you've got tight soil, your soil is, oops. I sh you, I, I'm the one who broke it, not me, not you. <laughs> um, calcium is a larger atom than magnesium. And um, um, calcium is considered to f uh, flocculate your soil, which basically means to open up, to loosen your soil. And magnesium is considered to tighten your soil. So if you've got a clayey soil, which is tight, which doesn't have, if you can't fit your hand down into your ground, is too tight. We didn't talk about air yet. I talked about water a lot, but I didn't really talk about air. You should figure as far as you can reach your hand down into your soil is about as far as the air can reach down into your soil. Um, and you'd really like to be able to reach your hand down a good few inches, if not further, into your soil. Um, where you can't, your soil's tight, the last thing you want to add is magnesium. Dolomitic lime where I live in Massachusetts, all the lime quarries are dolomite. So the only lime you can get is dolomitic lime. You can't get calcitic lime unless you're willing to go out of the state. And everybody's like, it's lime is lime. Why would I pay for, you know, hauling it from New York State? Because you don't want tight soil unless you've got sand. If you've got sand, you want tight soil because otherwise, you know, things wash out of it too fast. If you've got clay soil, you want to have more calcium, you want more openness, you want looseness. Right? So, um, ag lime is generally whatever's cheapest. Right? Like, whatever's $8 a ton is considered to be ag lime. It's, it doesn't necessarily have a small particle size. Um, it's kind of chunky. Um, it's a really basic, basic material. It is inexpensive. It will functionally raise your pH. But if you don't pay attention to whether it's got calcium in it or magnesium in it, um, you may have systemic negative effects over time that um, you really wish you didn't. Um, have because you didn't know the difference. So um, that's an important point there about limestone is that dol dolomitic lime will compact your soil, make it tighter. Um, the calcitic lime will loosen your soil, make it more aerated. Um, and air is at least as important as water in the function of life. Anybody? Aragonite is, cal is calcite, is a, cal is a calcium. Aragonite is uh, old seashells, pretty much, um, whereas limestone is more the diatoms, I think. The aragonite is more seashells. Um, they're both from the ocean. Um, yeah. I haven't used crab shells. I think they've got phosphorus in them, too, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure. Do, do they? I don't have experience. I should know more than I do. Um, okay. What's that? No shoes? No I didn't make. So I, I didn't know take more notes. Than I do. I. Last night you said it's not about like shall or shall not. Well, shall, shall and should, should maybe it'd be different. I don't know. <laughs> um, I am. I'm regularly reminded of my ignorance, and so 
I perhaps framed it incorrectly. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm there, I laughed for you. Okay, good. As long as you're laughing, it's nothing else. You can't control. You can't control anything else. So, anyone else? Um, so we go from inoculation, which is one of the simplest and I would suggest most powerful and least expensive things you can do, to seed quality, um, which is uh, far from easy to address. Um, and, but it's also a very significantly important, um, and I don't think there's any good easy answers to it. Um, um, a lot of the issues we have written up here uh, have to do with seed, um, and we'll talk about those as we, as, as we review those questions later. Um, my understanding is that um, traditional cultures uh, considered their seed to be one of their most valuable um, um, aspects, their cultural wisdom, their, um, their, you know, their viability going forward, um, really uh, verging on sacred uh, seed. And <clears throat> my experience in this culture is that seed is almost entirely commodified. Um, and uh, we don't even have a concept that there's a difference in seed. Um, I know as a younger farmer myself, I would look at seed catalogs and I'd be looking at, you know, red brandy wine tomatoes or purple brandy wine tomatoes, whatever, and I would see purple brandy wine in this catalog for a dollar ten cents a packet and purple brandy wine in this catalog for a dollar fifty a packet. And why would I spend the extra forty cents? I'll always buy the cheaper seed. Um, there's a lot of dumb things you can do. Uh, <laughs> um, but buying poor quality seeds right up there at the top of the list, as far as I'm concerned. Um, buying seed in general might be a dumb thing to do, but most of us don't have our um, business together enough to actually be saving our own. Um, seed quality, seed history, seed vigor. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of how the industry works right now, and then we can talk about some of the logistics and what you can do. Um, I got this uh, information from talking to a guy named John Navazio, who's recently published a book on seed. Uh, he was a founder of the Organic Seed Alliance, worked out in uh, the Pacific Northwest for 30 years as a seedsman. Now he's working for Johnny's, um, John Navazio. Um, <clears throat> he gave me the example of, I think it was Thai spinach. Um, Can you spell his last name? Novazio, N-O-V-A-Z-I-O, -O John Novazio. Um, um, he said, uh, so there's, you know, uh, Thai is a, is a, is a hybrid. Um, which means it belongs to a company, which means no one else is allowed to make it, uh, to sell it, to, to raise it. Um, so Taiyi is, there's uh, two farms in Oregon that grow all the seed for the planet for the year. The company that owns the Taiyi seed um, contracts with those two farms, and then when they grow the seed, they harvest the plants and give all the seed back to the company. and. That's it. That is your supply for the year. Um, the company then uh, takes the seed and runs it through a series of what's called screens. Um, the largest seed is taken out. Um, you know, this, uh, there's different size screens. So, like a 14 screen would be a large, a larger size for a, a spinach seed. Um, the large, so the, the 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 12s and the 14s are pulled out and sold to the farmers in the Salinas Valley that plant 50 acres of spinach at a time. Uh, they're the ones who have relationships with the company and, you know, they're the best friends. They all live out there on the West Coast together. Um, and all the, all the biggest, heaviest, most vital seed uh, you never have a chance at. End of conversation. It all goes to, this comp to, the, to these big farms in Salinas Valley. Then they, put, they keep putting it through the screens, the stuff that's the 10 screen stuff. Um, will then be sold maybe to farmers who buy 50 pounds of seed at a time, um, maybe in New York State or something. Um, and then they'll, they'll, keep, they'll continue to screen it, and everything that's uh, eight screen um, is the stuff that will germinate. Anything below, below eight probably won't germinate, and so that's the, that's the, the trash. Um, but uh, all the eight screen seed is what the packet trade buys. So if you buy your seed in packets, Anybody who sells it in packets buys it in big bags and puts it in packets and puts their label on it and sells it to you, right? This is how it works. So the packet trade, um, they buy the stuff that will germinate because it costs less and then they market up as much as they can. Um, this is the way the industry works. 
as I understand it, full stop, end of conversation. What's that? We have a local seed um, company called Southern Exposure. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know other business. I think it's, they obviously use Soundback. I, I'm aware of Southern Exposure, yeah. I don't know. I mean, they do have packets, but I don't think they're. They're our neighbors. They do right behind us. Mm -hmm. And Ira knows a lot and is a great seed saver. I'm not saying that about her, she's a friend. Yeah. But they've gotten so big so fast that they are using farmer here, farmer there, farmer somewhere else yeah. to grow their seed right. without the hands on supervision that they used to have. Yep. Twin oaks is where it is. It's yeah. acorn mm -hmm. and twin oaks. Yeah. And they've lost a lot of control. I used to buy a lot of seed from them and I've struggled with it. Recently. Recently because I'm not getting Quality. The vigor you'd like. Yeah. Also. <clears throat> yeah. Details. Yeah, details. <laughs> seed is a really big issue. Seed is a really big issue, and we don't talk about it. We don't think about it. We don't want to talk about it. Um, we really need to talk about seed, as far as I'm concerned. So pardon me if I want to wanna, wanna, for the next 10 minutes. I um, just want to say before we move on that there's, a, there's a definitely a major difference between like a grassroots seed cooperative where groups of farmers in the same region are partnering with one another and on those different places uh, in their in their respective places are growing different things out mm -hmm. because that's the nature of, of seed production you know certain distances of separation and so forth. if you and want to have um, varieties yeah. that are all exactly the same sure. which is not how humans have been doing it for a long time Traditionally, humans did what was called land race, which was they would take some of the early, some of the middle, some of the late, some of the drought resistant, some of the you know flood resistant, and they you know keep it all together. Um, I don't know. Yes, I understand that the the, the logistics of uniformity all that have been. All I mean to point out is the difference between a, a, a small seed cooperative and yeah. like a corporate mess, mm -hmm. you know, which is that situation where those two farmers that are really big in Oregon grow. Yeah. But the point is, a small seed cooperative might be just as much of a mess. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know what to do with. There's the, what are they called in, in Iowa? The uh, Seed Savers Exchange? Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, they've got thousands of seed, of people growing seed and saving seed and sending it back in. Um, we were talking about um, epigenetics a little bit earlier. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I'm aware of a study that was done at the University of Iowa, or Iowa State, I can't remember which one, in Iowa. They took the uh, prize-winning sow from the Iowa State Fair. I think it was done in the 70s. Um, the prize-winning sow was like the best conformity. You know, she's a hot little, hot little number. Good-looking pig, right? And they said, what's the effect of nutrition on genetics? And they said, we're going to feed this optimal genetics pig poorly and see what happens. Uh, it took two generations to get down to downer pigs, right? Her grand piglets were the kind of pigs that couldn't stand up without breaking their legs. It took two generations to wear out the DNA. Um, like, oh, wow, interesting. Then they said, what'll happen if we take these downer pigs and start feeding them well? It took two generations to get back to prize-winning form. The effect of nutrition on physiological development is categorical. This is what Albrecht was noticing with the World War I, you know, draft records and the soil types, was what the boys were eating and maybe what their parents were eating when, as they were, you know, when their mothers were eating, when they were, they were pregnant, etc., had a massive effect on their physiological development. So for me, the issue is who is growing the mother plants and how are they growing them? Um, we know about uh, early childhood development. We know about the, you know, effect of the nutrition, the nutritional status of the mother on the health of the baby. Um, I don't think we take this into consideration. Um, whether it's big corporate farms or local seed savers, um, you know, my understanding is that the reason you can't get a lot of organic seed is because organic seed savers can't get the plants to go to the full life cycle without them being taken out by disease. Right, they simply can't. We're gonna stop. We're gonna change it. What's that? We're gonna change it. Well, this is a really important topic. We, yeah. That's exactly what we're gonna do. Is we're, is we're gonna start g helping farmers grow healthy mother plants and help them save their seeds so we can share it. I mean, 
the vigor of the seed is such a massively important piece of the puzzle. It's such a massively important piece of the puzzle, and you know you can have otherwise mediocre environmental conditions and have good, healthy seed, and really, you know, get results you don't deserve, right? And with good, healthy seed, with with really vigorous seed, you can get results in mediocre environmental conditions. And what's going on is we are have mediocre environmental conditions and crappy quality seed, and we're struggling year after year after year because we're putting down seed that's weak. As far as I'm concerned, this is my experience, and I've, been, I've begun to experiment with saving seed and planting seed and growing seed out. One generation saves on my farm and seen results that are stupefying, absolutely stupefying, as far as increases in yield, increases in vigor, increases in vitality, through nothing else than letting my plants go to seed and pulling them up and shaking the seed out on a piece of plastic and then planting it. Right? It doesn't need to be complicated, but my experience is that a lot of what you get from the store is stuff that was jacked up on NP and K, organic or otherwise, right? Conventionally fed, they, they, they weren't running on IV drip. They were running on Gatorade. They were not running on food. Their mothers were not healthy mothers, right? They were sprayed regularly to keep the fungus at bay. That's like having cancer and being on chemotherapy while you're pregnant. Right? Would you think, would you want your grandchild to be born from a, you know, a woman who's on chemotherapy while she's pregnant? Now, you know that that, that grandchild's going to be in rough shape. You don't think about the health of the mother plant and what the effects are on the, on the seed you're getting. For me, this is a really big deal. And um, it's kind of intuitive. It kind of is like, okay, duh. And... I don't hear people talking about it, and I, I don't know if it's, if it's like willful ignorance or we simply haven't put the pieces together. Um, I have been calling up and hassling all the seed companies that I know. I haven't talked to Southern Exposure. I've talked to Baker Creek. I've talked to Johnny's. I've talked to Fedco. I've talked to High Mowing. I've talked to, um, I think those are the biggest ones I've talked to. Um, there's a couple little ones, Turtle Tree and things like that I've talked to. but, um, but there does not seem to be an interest in the seed industry in um, providing seed from mother plants that are operating at a high level of vigor and vitality. It's all about volume. It's about volume. And a friend of mine, actually, who is a really good agronomist, and he's a consultant, was working. One of his clients was a tomato seed grower. And, and we had been going back and forth about seed and the importance of seed. And he's like, I'm going to put together a protocol that's going to be awesome for seed. And he did. And his customer, you know, applied it and grew some amazing tomato seed and sent it in, and it got sent back because it was too big. Right. It was too big. It's too big. Too much vitality. Um, you can't if you're selling if you're selling by the seed, and, and you're buying by the pound, you lose money if you're selling high quality seed. It's simply not economics, <laughs> right? I mean, this perverse. It is perverse. As I understand it. You know, as there is no, it, what's that? As long as, at least in corn and grain, like, if you have a higher chest weight, more minerally dense plant, you're going to yeah. have a higher chest weight, you know, more. Um, the larger the seed, the more. You're going to get. The few, you want as, 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 few, as few bushels, as few seeds per bushel. Seeds, the as, same amount of pounds, mm -hmm. you know, it's in a, the grower's favor. But you're saying that the seed companies for small packets are selling certain X number of seeds yeah. in a packet. So, if they're buying by the pound, it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's really important to save seed, and there's a bunch of good people doing it. And it doesn't take many good people that have been doing it for a while to start working together. I won't do a few things. That's all. I don't do anywhere near everything I should. But I got my son doing it. He thinks it's cool. I give him lots of positive reinforcement, and he's like out there and he's saving his seed. Shoot. Nothing complicated about it. You don't need to do. You, I, I, I did this experiment with arugula seed because I grow a lot of salad greens. I, and my experience buying arugula seed is like it's a pain in the butt to grow arugula. I don't use nitrogen on my farm. I don't use compost. I don't use, you know, I don't use fish. I don't use nitrogen because I think 
that two-thirds of the atmosphere is nitrogen or three-quarters of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and you shouldn't need to use nitrogen. Right. Anybody who uses nitrogen, you know, is violating nature. You should not need to use nitrogen, so I don't do it, even though if I did, I get better yields. I just have this little thing about nitrogen. Um, and it's really hard to get arugula to grow without giving it nitrogen. It turns yellow, it turns purple, it just does not have vigor. It sits there and it stunts if it's not optimal conditions. So I did this experiment a couple years ago. I bought four pounds of, of arugula seed from Johnny's and I planted three of them and I kept one back. And I, I you know, picked those three, I picked them three pounds, I picked them four or five times, whatever it was, till the next planting came on and then I just let them be. Didn't do anything, didn't mow them, till them, plant anything else, just let them be, let them go to seed. And when they got up to go on to seed, and the seed pods formed and the seed pods filled and the seed pods dried down. I just pulled the plants up out of the ground and got an old piece of greenhouse plastic and shook them out on the greenhouse plastic. And then, you know, poured that into a quart container and planted that seed <coughs> next to the pound that I'd kept back. This is just my own little experiment. I knew it was the same batch. I knew it was the same genetics except one generation on my land. And the difference was categorical. The Increase in vigor, vitality, you know, speed of growth, thickness of leaf, size of leaf, lack of purpling, lack of yellowing. It was absolutely categorical. It was, a dram it was just mind-blowing, the increase in vitality that I got by doing nothing more than not tilling under a crop that was gone by. Right? So if you come to my farm in the summertime, you'll see hoop houses that, like, why aren't you growing anything in your hoop house? It's all weeds in here. No, it's not weeds. It's all greens gone to seed, right? I just let them be. Just let them be. Don't do anything. Don't bother them. You know, I don't need the space. Call it a cover crop if you want to call it a cover crop. Call it a fallow ground if you want to call it fallow ground. I'm just letting my crops go to seed and letting them be. So um, it doesn't need to be there very difficult, right? People have been saving seed for a long time with all, it, all kinds of fancy systems and everything else. It doesn't need to be hard. Um, you know, there's ways you can sort seed by, you can, you can, you know, sort it by size pretty rapidly. Um, just one minor comment and I'll answer some questions. I was talking to a guy at Johnny's um, when I was hassling seed companies about this a couple of years ago and saying, you know, I, was, I, I honestly couldn't figure out whether they didn't know, were honestly ignorant, or they were just, didn't want to talk about it or what was going on. And I kept asking, well, can you, I was asking all these questions, and, and they're like, well, I'll put you under my boss. And then like, oh, I'll put you under my boss. And I finally got somebody who's like up there in Johnny's. And I was asking him about this. And he's like, sometimes we have Bolero carrots at 100,000 seeds per pound, and sometimes we have Bolero carrots at 800,000 seeds per pound. I'm like, what? He's like, but they all germinate. I'm like, it doesn't matter if they germinate. It matters if they have vigor. Anybody ever planted tomatoes? And like a few germinate five or six days after you plant them and then two weeks goes by or maybe two weeks after you plant them, they all germinate. Mm -hmm. Those are the runts, the ones that germinated at two weeks. Yeah. Right? The runts are 95% of the litter in the seeds you get. They either sorted out all the good ones or there was no good ones to begin with. The How to Grow World Record Tomatoes book guy, I mean, he's really really clear about this. You find the biggest seeds and only the biggest seeds, the heaviest seeds, and those are the ones you plant. If you take a seed packet of tomatoes and you pull them out and you look at them on your hand, you take the fat ones and you plant them here, and you take the flat ones and you plant them there, you'll see these ones germinate in five days, seven days, these ones germinate in 14 days. You can absolutely predict it. And you can grow them all the way out and you can see which ones have bigger and which ones don't. It's a, sorry, yes. Totally tracking with you. I'm just going to list Three people that for people who are who would be interested in getting your if you want seed from somebody who's doing what he's talking about. Yes. You know, the only person I met, and I know there are a couple more, but the only person I met on the East Coast who's doing that is Will Bonsall. Is he doing he it? He's in Maine. Yeah. He, he talks all the time about selecting for bigger. It's one, it's one of his primary criteria. Okay. And then Roan White with Sierra Seeds in Northern California, and Don Tipping at Siskiyou Seeds in Oregon. I've heard about Siskiyou. Yeah. yeah. That's a cooperative as well. I talked to, um, who was the lettuce guy? Frank Morton about this, about nutrition and stuff. And Frank was like, yeah, I use compost and uh, limestone. I was like, Frank Morton? Do you use, I use this compost and limestone? 
don't you understand the role of these trace elements in the enzyme systems and the he I guess he might have he has good good land to begin with, but no. uh, it's a sorry. It's, sorry. No, no, I want to write the names down. Rowan White it was with what company? Uh, she's Sierra Seed in Northern California. Obviously that's not bioregionally relevant. As bioregionally relevant people here, but there's still some that You take them and you pl plant them here for one year, now yeah. they're bioregionally yeah. relevant. Yeah. And then Don Sipping is at Siskiyou. And he he exercises a great degree of oversight over the cooperative that um, mm -hmm. is Siskiyou Seed. How do you spell it? S I S K I Y O U? Y O U, I think, after that, yeah. And um, and then Will Bonsall. Will Bonsall is a scatter seed project. Yep. Uh, and now, I believe, am I right that John Navazio is working for for Johnny's? He's working for Johnny's now. That doesn't mean he has control there, but those like Johnny's and High Moen, who people like us tend tend to think of as small seed companies compared yeah. to these giant conglomerates, are actually doing a lot of that stuff that you were talking about. Before. Absolutely. That's ma the main way that they do it. Is High Moen has. I've given the I've given this this course in High Mowing's hometown, <laughs> and people who run the food co-op in High Mowing's hometown don't want to sell High Mowing seeds because they don't germinate. Yeah. Same thing you're saying about 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 southern exposure. They just have crappy vigor. They don't produce. Seed quality is really important, and just because it's got a name on the label and breeds and comes true to type does not mean this. I love, I, I grow lots of tomatoes. I grow like 60, 70 varieties of tomatoes. I like to have at least eight varieties of white tomatoes, eight varieties of yellow ones, eight varieties of green ones, stripes, pinks, purples, the whole thing, right? And Baker Creek is the company that's got the best spectrum of variation and variety, and the quality of their seeds is so atrocious, right? You just need to buy the seed and save it, and next year you got half a chance of having some kind of vigor. From in, in general, but Baker Creek, I mean, you, you're, you're not going to get the variation that you find in Baker Creek that you find anywhere else. Rareseeds.com. We've had to stop buying from them because it's so terrible. It's horrible. At every level. Everything we bought from them is awful. A, it's expensive. It's gotten worse and worse. Now they're big and famous and rich. You think they would do a better job. Yeah. And getting germination off of them last year. But two generations. Even one generation, but. Yeah. You're affecting generations. This is, what's exciting here is the opportunity is massive. The opportunity is massive and no one's doing it. We are, I mean, I've, I've been talking to this guy in Vermont for a couple of years now about this issue and um, he has finally committed to coordinating a collaboration amongst BFA growers. So anybody who's registered for this course, you are on our email list and you will get an email from us every month. Um, generally around the beginning of the month. Um, it will oftentimes go into your bulk mail folder. So if you don't check your bulk email folder, right, promotions it's called on Gmail, I'm not sure what it's called on Yahoo or Hotmail, um, you will get a newsletter from us every month. If you don't check your bulk mail folder, you'll never know. But um, there is going to be an active coordination on this topic um, coming out in the next month or two for people. Uh, we really, this is a really important topic and something I really want to make, make progress on and we haven't been able to, but I think we might just um, this year. So, who do you recommend we buy seeds I from? don't. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to recommend someone. We've got a couple recommendations from over here. Right, I, right. I wrote them down because it's better than nothing. Right. Um, but you still sort through them and pick out the biggest and best. And, I mean, what I should do and what I do do oftentimes are <laughs> right, right. not entirely in line. Um, I generally get heir get heirloom or open pollinated seeds. I don't buy hybrids. When I do when I do buy seeds, I try to find the ones. I read the descriptions very closely um, for the ones that have uh, vigor, that have flavor. Um, um, generally, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for variation. I get as many different varieties as I can. Um, you know, if you see my tomato box, you see my uh, every bunch of carrots I sell. You know, they are not the same color. They are not the same shape. Uh, radishes. You know, I mean, you name it. I try to. I, I pride myself on variation. Mm -hmm. you, you buy 10 pounds of summer squash from me, you got, you got, you know, you got crook necks, you got, you know, warty ones, you got flat ones, there are all kinds of zucchinis, I mean, you get all kinds of shapes of zucchinis. Um, I had, I mean, for me, I consider it to be a successful crop, say, of zucchini or summer squash, 
if I plant it in the spring and I'm picking it in the fall. And this year, this past year, absolutely categorically planted in the spring, was picking them middle of October. We, had, we came down to like 19 degrees or something like that, and that killed just about everything. Um, but the hybrids died first. My open pollinators were, were kicking butt all the way through, right? The gold, good old crookneck, we're, we're just going strong through the year. But the multi-pick, yellow squash, you know, they produced for three or four weeks, and then they hit the, hit the wall and, and crashed. So my thought is that the open pollinators um, have not been bred for functioning in an NPK fertility environment. They've been selected in a more, you know, soil-like environment, and they've been selected more for flavor, and uh, which correlates with nutrition, than they have been for picking and shipping and, um, and things like that. So um, I, generally, I generally will err on the side of, of, of buying open pollinators. I buy very few, if any, hybrids, actually. Um, Functionality, yeah, and for and for mass and thick and thick thick walls, thick thick you know skins for shipping. Um, they're designed to be picked raw, right? I mean hybrids are not designed; they have not been bred for nutrition, right? Which is which is which is taste. There is a good group coming out. Um, you might know about this. Uh, where are they? They're they're um, not fruition seeds. There's a group which is working with chefs to culinary, uh, breeding. culinary breeding network. Culinary breeding network. I have heard about them, but I haven't tracked them down yet. Is there any advantage of getting organically certified seed? Um, I care more about the size of the seed than I do about the um, label on it. And so one thing I do do, and I recommend people do, I'm not sure how many people actually do it, um, is you identify what varieties you think you want, and then you identify which seed companies have those varieties, and you call them up, and before you order anything, you ask about every single variety what the test weight is or the uh, screen size. So as an example, when I'm ordering the, this four pounds of arugula I ordered um, for my little research project, I called up High Mowing and I said, "Hi Mowing, I want Astro Arugula. Uh, what's your what's your seed size?" They went click, click, click. Two hundred and fifty thousand seeds per pound. Uh, no, they were three hundred. Sorry, three three hundred thousand seeds per pound. I called up. I said, "Thank you very much," and hung up. I called up Fedco. I said, "Fedco, I'm looking for Astro Arugula. What's your seed size per for Astro Arugula?" And they said, "Click, click, click. Two hundred and seventy-five thousand seeds per pound." I said, "Thank you very much," and hung up. I called up Johnny's. I said, Johnny's, I'm looking for Astro Arugula. What's your seed size per, you know, on Astro seeds per pound? They said, 250,000 seeds per pound. I said, all right, I'll order it. The fewest seeds per pound means the biggest seeds, means the heaviest seeds, means the best vigor, means the biggest germ. Um, and I don't care so much whether it's organic or not. I care about the test weight. Um, I, know, I know there's some conventional growers which are doing a good job with nutrition and plenty of organic growers who are not. And um, if my long-term vision is to save this seed for myself, I want to be starting off with the best germ that might give me an extra generation of, of vigor somewhere along the process. Anybody ever save dill seed? Dill? You plant your dill seed, but you don't plant all of it? Yeah. And then you get your dill, and you look at the seed that's still in the packet, and the seed that you just grew from that seed, and you're like, it's like four times bigger. <laughs> it's like four times bigger. Try it with dill. It's because dill seeds are so big, it's really easy to see. And then save it. Yes, but you, I mean, basically, the, the size of the germ, the weight. So with, with grain, it's called test weight, mm -hmm. right? So 56 pounds is what a bushel of corn is supposed to weigh. And um, some bushels of corn weigh 48 pounds, and some bushels of corn weigh 62 pounds. And 62 is like that. What's that? You're determining density. What, well, test, you're determining whether rate. you've got hydrogens and oxygens in there or yeah. whether you've got magnesiums yeah, and calciums and cobalts in there. Measure. Right. Um, with bushels of apples, there's the same thing. There's, there's a weight, a bushel of apples is 40, 42 pounds or something like that, 45 pounds. But some bushels of apples are 50 pounds and some bushels are 35 pounds, right? You see the old grandmother's at the grocery store and she picks up the squash and she gives it a heft. Yeah. 
she's feeling like that's one thing you can, that's, if you know how to give it a heft, you can feel. Is it dense or is it light? Yeah. If it's light, it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have nutrition in it. It has all these light, you know, hydrogens and oxygen and things. It doesn't have the heavy metals that are, that are the compounds and the nutrients you're looking for. You got a question? A comment and an comment. observation. Please. I had parsnip seed one time that was given to me from a home gardener, had our garden for many years probably. Yeah. Parsnip seed is notorious for not sprouting the next year. Yeah. I stored in that, used that parsnip seed, it was stored in a glass jar on an enclosed porch, you know, sheltered but basically mo the temperature moderated but the temperature followed the outside. Yeah. Five years later, it was still 25% sprouting. Yeah. Just, you know, the quality of the seed was different than anything you could, you could buy at all. And it lasted that much more life in the seed just because of the nutrition that went into it to begin with. Carrot seed? You know, you got year-old carrot seed? You better chuck it because <laughs> it ain't going to germinate. Well, I store all my seeds in the freezer. Everything. I store all my seeds in the freezer. Absolutely. They definitely don't go bad as fast that way. But, um... You know, this is a really important topic, and um, boy, I don't know. I just I have an air new man of balmy. It's a, we've had for 40 years. At my I have a seed crop from '89 in the freezer. It's still 25 percent sprouting. <laughs> Guys, it's time to grow it out. I think they found <laughs> some wheat or something in a uh, yeah. Egyptian they tomb yep. that was 4,000 years old, yeah. Yeah. and they planted Super it and germinated. <clears throat> yeah. Literally. Hum humidity and temperature added together need to be l below 90. Yeah. For storage. Um, but the vigor of the seed to begin with is the X factor that people don't talk about. They just don't talk about it. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it's massively important. Um, and uh, I don't have an easy answer for you. There is no easy answer. With inoculation, get your hands on some inoculant. It's critically valuable. It's so easy. It's totally inexpensive. You know, bang for your buck is massive. Seed quality, good luck. Good luck. We're going to try to coordinate something with people to help, you know, get, get um, access to better vigor and better vitality. There's a bunch of good organizations and networks around the country that are mean well by saving seed, but you have sickly mother plants. The, the seed off those sickly mother plants is not necessarily something you want to be planting. Right? That's the one minor issue that people seem to ignore with all the seed-saving stuff that's going on there. Anyway, all right. Um, oh, I didn't talk about culling. Um, I, the implication on culling is that when you have those tomatoes that germinate at two weeks, you should be culling them all. Right? Anyone know how hard it is to cull seedlings? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not hard for you. <laughs> you know better. <laughs> you have a hard time culling your cows? Right? I mean, you know the importance of culling your cows? You know the importance of culling your seedlings. Um, we'll talk about SRI tomorrow, system of rice intensification, system of crop intensification, spacing, um, yield potential. Um, it's, it's on the handout for today and tomorrow. I think we'll do it tomorrow. But um, yeah, getting your better, bigger seedlings more space will actually dramatically increase your yields. There's some amazing, amazing information about, about that that we'll cover. And aside we'll cover on culling, some up ornamental things, the best colors are in the ones that sprout the course and the latest the best the, the best, best color. colors yes speed the ones that are ordinary usually sprout the quickest and the ones that are have better colors oftentimes are the ones that come up slower and stragglers very interesting <clears throat> they're the uh, genetic the, the opposite of what you want for your vegetable product. yeah um is it I had this understanding that you know, observation kind of that if a plant doesn't have enough nutrition, like sometimes people say, oh, my peppers produce a lot of peppers, but like they weren't healthy in the seed, it's not dense, you know, and because the plant was stressed, so it's it like overproduced yield, mm -hmm. but it's not quality. Um, I'm not sure. Kind of like a grass plant, like if you stress it, it'll go to seed really fast. Mm -hmm. It'll be trying to like just make it to the next generation almost, but it won't have. I would look at the size of the, size of the seed. I think the size of the seed is a really easy way to discern relative value. And uh, if you've got a lot of flat seeds with no germ, there you can figure, I mean, most of them won't germinate. Um, but uh, the thickness, the, 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 the roundness of the seed generally is a, is a pretty good, 
uh, connect uh, court. Yeah. I uh, hybridized the day lily the last ten years, and saving seed is the secret. But I found that if I don't support the plant during the seed maturing phase, I yeah. have poor seed. Absolutely. <clears throat> anybody know where anybody's ever been pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> I think my mother was. Yeah. <laughs> my wife's been pregnant a couple times. <clears throat> it's real interesting to watch a pregnant woman. You know what happens to a pregnant woman when she's not being fed well? <laughs> Anybody? Yes? I do. Yeah. That's exactly what happens, is that the, the, the system falls apart. In my case, <clears throat> my brother was being nursed while I was being formed. Yes. Exactly. My mother's teeth fell out when she was 22 years old. Yep. Yep. All of her teeth gone. Yep. I have spinal deformities and other irregularities in my bone. Yep. Because of this deficiency in my lactose intolerant mother. Yep. When you've got a tomato plant that's two feet tall and it's set in its first couple flowers and those first couple flowers turn into fruit and they start filling what you've got as far as i'm concerned is a pregnant 14 year old right she just hit puberty she has not built her adult body yet she's pregnant what's she going to do where's the priority go for nutrition yeah, it goes to the baby. Yeah. The mother will sacrifice her body. The genetics have evolved it this way. The, the, the mother's body is sacrificed to feed the baby. We do not understand that when our plants are setting fruit and filling fruit, they're pregnant. They're functionally pregnant and they're hungry just like a pregnant woman is hungry. And if you don't keep them fed, they'll fall apart real fast. We got all these diseases, right? We got the powdery mildew, we got the downy mildew, we got the blights, we got the insects, we got all these things, and we don't understand that we've got really hungry, pregnant women. They're starving to death, and they're physiologically falling apart while they're trying to squeeze out one last baby, and we're trying to kill the disease. She's just hungry. She's just hungry. When you create the environment where she's getting her needs met, she's fine. She's beautiful in her pregnancy. She's vibrant, right? What do you hear? This is all tomorrow's conversation, oh. is when the plants are growing, <laughs> it's a, tomorrow? it's a, well, that night you have to come back. <laughs> understand that it's, that it's, understand that it's a living, it's a living system, and that the, the, the life cycles of, you know, the mother and the baby and the germination and the seed and the inoculation and the colostrum and the early childhood development and I mean, all these life cycles, systems, and issues, and patterns are basically exactly the same. If you understand humans, you understand animals, you understand plants, it's the same. It's life. It's the life cycle, it's the pattern, and, and you can really, you, can, it, it, you don't need to read books, you don't need to understand science, you don't really need to take tests. Right? You just need to use some common sense and look at the situation and sort of stand back and feel, get a feel for it. It's my experience. It's, it, we, really, we really have the faculties to figure this stuff out. But we need to understand you know, what frame of mind we're to be in to, to perceive. Anyway, um, I think I've said enough about seed. I'm a little bit sensitive to the fact that we're supposed to be done in 15 minutes. So I'm just going to finish the last couple slides here. Um, that's going to be on tomorrow morning's gotcha. conversation. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm little, yes. <laughs> uh, potting soil. Um, as I said before, this conversation, this, this handout was designed to be uh, presented in the fall um, with a follow on handout in the spring. Um, and so, what I'm recommending here for people is to get potting soil that they're starting their seedlings in that contains much more than your basic um, rudimentary ingredients. Um, um, there's this thing called uh, sterile media. Anybody heard of the sterile media? Right? Yeah. You buy it in garden supply stores. What does sterile mean? Dead. Dead. It means we promise we've killed everything in it. We are proud of the fact that th there's no life in here. Anybody who's proud of the fact there's no life in soil is somebody whose perspective you need to be seriously questioning. 
far as I'm concerned, right? It's a foundational flaw in thinking that, that a lack of life is a good thing. Um, I generally suggest, and they'll have salt fertilizers in there, little, little pellets yeah. sometimes, right? That is like antibiotics and an IV drip. You know, you want to make crack babies who are addicted to soluble fertilizer and, and can't digest their food? This is one of the best ways to do it. Absolute best ways to do it if you want to cross the metaphors back and forth, right? Um, so I strongly recommend against using that kind of material as a, as a starting medium. Um, I do recommend that we, I mean, generally the compost-based potting soils are the best things you can get on the market. Um, um, oftentimes they'll be uh, bulked out with some peat or with some vermiculite or with some perlite to make them light so there's air in the potting soil. Um, I don't know why you sh can't dig soil out of the ground and put it in trays except it just turns into rock. It, my experience has been, I'm like, why can't I just start my seeds in the ground? Like, they should start. Anybody, tomatoes that germinate in the garden take off and rock, yeah. right? But you can't dig that soil out of the ground and put it in a tray and put the tomato in it because it doesn't act like soil anymore. It's my experience. It doesn't, it doesn't stay loose, it compacts. So anyway, um, what's that? I started it with the garden soil, but it's stuff we put a lot of biology in. Yeah, I haven't, my experience of doing it has not been successful. But um, I think one of the key things you need to have is air in the potting soil. And that's why the perlite and the vermiculite and the peat and the coir are all put in there is to maintain that loft and so that the, the, the soil life can breathe. It's really foundational. Um, anyway, what I've got here is a list of other ingredients you could be putting into your potting soil um, in very small quantities. But um, basically the idea is that you want your babies to have a balanced diet uh, um, from as early in their life cycle as possible. Uh, we know what's early childhood development thing. People heard about early childhood development? What goes on in the first six months of life, first two years of life, has a profound effect on the rest of life, right? Um, your bone density, your immunity, your psychic skills, like all major, major life um, systems. Like when you're born, they're a bit plastic, they're a bit f flexible, but then um, based on the environment you're born into, you sort of begin to set a trajectory, a pattern. Actually, it starts in utero, and actually it starts before utero. Um, actually, your mother's health status, nutritional status, when she's pregnant, when she gets pregnant, you know, has a lot to do with it. I mean, as we're studying it, it's moving back and back further and further into the previous generation is what's, what's, what's coming to find out. But uh, either way, the question is, do you want your children to have macaroni and cheese between birth and kindergarten? Or would you like them to have a, like them to have a balanced diet? Because um, generally, your basic, your, your basic potting soil with not much in it functionally is like macaroni and cheese. It may keep them alive, but it's not going to build strong bones. Um, and so my suggestion is that you amend your potting soil with some of these ingredients. Um, I don't have anything specific as far as quantities and logistics because I don't know what your potting soil is to be working with in the first place. Um, I suggest you might need to use the cooking trick of... Anybody cook? People cook here. How much basil do you put in? A lot. <laughs> like, when do you stop putting the basil in? Or the marjoram or something? Like, for me, this is like a feel. Like, it's like almost a, like a resistance I can feel between my fingertips. Let me know what I'm talking about. It's like a sensation. It's like a, it's a very subtle sensation. Like, oh, I think that's enough. You can almost feel your whole body like, oh, I want to do more, I want to do more. No, I don't want to do any more. It's like almost like a physiological feeling that I get. It's subtle, but I feel it. You're way too right brain. And left-handed. <laughs> we're, we're the only people in our right brain. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> All you right-handers. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I feel for you. <laughs> I think it's four out of the five last U.S. presidents have been left-handed Leos. Really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a Leo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what Bernie is. Yeah. He's a Virgo. Is he a Virgo? <clears throat> um, and he doesn't have the Pope. Yes. Yes, he's in trouble for not being in New York. Yeah, the Pope invited him and nobody else, I think, is how it went down. Um, 
All right, so tillage, effective tillage on soil life. We didn't uh, talk about tillage anywhere near as I, much as I usually do. Um, I think we made a few uh, oblique references to it. Um, in general, my metaphor for tillage is uh, one of um, a city street. Um, where's the biggest city around here? Like Richmond? Richmond? Like they got a bunch of skyscrapers in Richmond? Not that many skyscrapers. Okay. So what's a main drag with skyscrapers on both sides? Broad Street. Broad Street? Broad Street. How broad is Broad Street? 80 feet? 60 feet? The subway in Richmond? No subway in Richmond. This is it's wider. We can do it without the subway for the time being, um, for the metaphorical purposes. But um, so let's say you take a rototiller down Broad Street. <clears throat> rototiller is as broad as Broad Street. Um, so it's 60 feet wide or, or something. And to be to scale, it maybe is going to till up uh, four or five feet down, right? Whatever, broad, rough, rough numbers. Um, what's going to be the effect on all the little organisms living in their little boxes when you take a tiller down Broad Street? <clears throat> Open windows and screen. Um, I suggest when you take the tiller down Broad Street, going down four or five feet, you're going to rip up a few things. You're going to rip up some gas mains, Infrastructure. water mains, sewer mains, electric lines, cable lines. They're all going to be shredded. Yeah? What's going to be the effect on all the little organisms living in their little boxes when all that infrastructure is shredded? Hey. Chaos and death. Mass die-off or, rioting. I mean, rioting, right? It's not, there, you are not going to be able to maintain that population density in that area for some time. Yes? Nobody can live with that cable. <laughs> or water, <laughs> or sewer. Or internet. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's what she was saying about the internet, or cable. Yeah, I guess they, they just, I, somewhat different. Um, my understanding is when you till up the ground, you may not actually kill the microbes with your tiller, but the effect on the environment is not too far different f from taking the Rototilla Town Broad Street. Their access to air, to water, to food, all the logistics of support of life are dramatically re reduced. And functionally, what occurs after tillage is a significant die-off. In, in the population, um, shortly thereafter, yeah. shortly thereafter. So what you have, ideally, in, in most soils, is a fungal bac bacterial fungal balance, or maybe even a fungal dominance. And my understanding is you get generally mass die-off immediately afterwards, and then the bacteria are the first people to reestablish. And um, then you have a bacterially dominant soil for some time until the fungi are able to reestablish, functionally, basically. Yeah, Bacteria. The bac bacteria will spike afterwards, and which kind of plants prefer a bacterially dominant environment? Weeds. Right. Okay. Weeds? You gotta go. I won't take offense. <laughs> um, we know about gut flora. We talked a little bit about gut flora. I don't really have time to do this, but I'm gonna just do it anyways. Well, then the bacteria die off because they use a nitrate pulse in that. So we can, this lady right here, we don't know her, extremely well versed on the whole microbes dynamic. I'm going to give you some broad strokes that I think are correct, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, We're all just learning. What's that? We're all just learning. Well, some of us are a little farther along than others of us are. Um, so uh, there's this idea of a bacterial fungal continuum. And here is a million to one. And here is uh, one to a million. And here's one to one. So here's a bacterially dominant environment. Here's a fungally dominant environment. Here's a fairly balanced 
environment, bacterial and fungal. Um, functionally, in the same way that there's different people living in the gut of a cow than there are living in the gut of a chicken, um, there are different people living in the gut of a cucumber than there are living in the gut of a pigweed than there are living in the gut of a apple tree. Yeah? Basically? Makes sense? Um, the plants that prefer a bacterially dominant environment that have a gut flora that is primarily bacterium are the plants who are early adapters whose job is to cover bare disturbed soil. When you disturb the soil, everybody dies off and then the bacteria establish rapidly. The bacteria reproduce rapidly and they take dominance immediately after that soil is disturbed, after you till the soil. Okay? Roughly so far? The plants that flourish in this environment we call weeds. We call them weeds. You want your weeds to grow? One of the best ways to do it? Till your soil. Best ways to do it, till your soil. Uh, if you let the land be and don't disturb it, you will see a natural progression in this direction. Right? You take bare soil, um, volcano erupts in Hawaii, Mount Alea, Mount Akea, I don't know who's erupting, uh, sends off some lava down the hillside, it cools, you come by and you do a um, microbial assay on that rock a year later, you'll find a bacterially dominant environment. You come back 500 years later in that same spot and you'll have a tropical jungle and a thoroughly fungally dominant environment. So there's a natural progression from bacterial dominance to fungal dominance. And our crops each have a, you know, a zone where they flourish. And it functionally goes from, people keep saying the brassicas, they have a, the least fungally dominant environment to, you know, lettuces to all the way on to tomatoes to um, brambles to trees, etc. So um, the more perennial the environment, the more fungally dominant the microbiology preference they have in the soil. Um, anyway, the process of tillage um, is a process by which you functionally move your soils back from fungal dominance to bacterial dominance, at least in the short term. And if you engage in tillage on a regular basis, you functionally never let that fungal dominance establish, and so you prevent, um, you know, the healthy gut flora from certain crops from establishing. And you always will struggle with weeds and um, pressures where the plant basically wants a certain biological community to flourish and it's not getting access to it. Um, that's a very short uh, comment on tillage. We can talk more about it tomorrow. Um, my personal uh, process when it comes to tillage is uh, when I don't need to, I don't do it. And if I keep my soil covered, um, either with cover crops that are winter kill and end up being mulch in the spring um, or mulch, um, there's almost zero need for tillage at all in when I'm planting in the spring. Uh, with overwintering cover crops like rye, uh, they may need to be um, knocked down. You can do things like uh, crimping. You can weed whack them in the in the milk stage. Um, there's, what are you laughing about over there? I'm laughing because Ray Archuleta drove his daughter's Volkswagen and made a video of him taking the rye crop down in his yard with his daughter's Volkswagen instead of roller. Yeah, and it worked. You can drag a bush hog; it's not turned on. You know, yeah. It, once it's at the right stage, it's not hard to kill it. Yeah. yeah, exactly to kill your rye and you can knock it down and it'll functionally be like a really nice um, mulch layer and you can plant right into it. Do you Absolutely. expose that full pollen? Is that the, that the stage? You, you the milk stage the is the point after which the uh, flower has been pollinated before the seed is viable. And so if you squish the head and you'll have a white milky fluid coming out. That's so the milk stage. Or you'll yeah. see a little flower. If, you know. Yeah. You want to wait until the flower is pollinated. When the flower is pollinated, then the plant goes through a hormonal shift and says, basically, I'm never going to grow another leaf. And so until that point in time, you can mow it and it'll come back, and you'll till it and it'll come back. And anybody who ever tried to kill rye in the spring may have found it to be a total pain in the butt. Um, but if you wait until it goes to that milk stage, so what I suggest is when, you do, when you're planting your cover crops, um, you do the overwintering cover crops in areas where you want to have your warm weather plants like your tomatoes and eggplants and cucumbers and squash and anything that's, that's frost sensitive um, because generally you won't be putting them in until the rye has already reached that milk stage at milk stage. I'm not sure if it's true down here or not. I'm not sure when your frost free dates are. Frost is the end of May. Yeah.
It's earlier uh, here, but I would if guess you it's earlier choose here. like vetch and rye flour, there there's similar maturing dates. So if you put like barley and rye, it's slightly off. So you can kind of really look at your cover crops by when you want to be planting next, and making sure you're picking varieties that are going to mature at the same time if you want to do it without herbicide. Yeah. yeah. Um, page five has a couple um, sort of general purpose slides. I think we can quickly address them. Um, most of this will actually be covered tomorrow. Um, um, <clears throat> so uh, when a plant is, is building compounds in its body, it starts with simple sugars. Um, as we talked about with photosynthesis, and out of those simple sugars, it's able to build carbohydrates. Um, only when the carbohydrates are built sufficiently mm -hmm. is it able to build complete proteins. The complexing of compounds base is, requires certain elements, certain enzymes, certain nutrients being present. And so this is a process of building greater and greater complexity. Um, we can talk about, you know, simple straw huts up to skyscrapers, right? You need to have a s complexity and then more complexity and then more complexity and then more complexity to get up to the skyscrapers if you want to think about the secondary metabolites as these really, really large complex compounds. So first sugars, then carbohydrates, then proteins, then uh, lipids and fats, and then finally these secondary metabolites, these compounds that correlate with flavor and aroma uh, for us. Um, there's an interesting correlation between uh, the plants building these compounds and its physiological resistance to pathogens. Um, this is where, this is a really exciting concept here. Uh, and in short, um, if there was a bale of hay in here um, when you all walked in this morning, uh, one of you or more may have considered sitting on it, but I would guess that none of you would have considered eating it. None of you would have considered eating it even though if a cow walked in, that's what she would have thought of doing with it. Why would a cow think of eating a bale of hay and you wouldn't? Because she can digest the cellulose in the hay and we can't, right? It was okay with that. No big deal. Call out a potato beetle larvae. Don't have livers. They don't have the enzymes in their guts to digest protein. Physiologically, those things we call pathogens, those things which eat our crops, those insects and diseases, have much less sophisticated digestive systems than we do. And <coughs> functionally, what I've got written down here is when the plant is able to build complete carbohydrates, it becomes physiologically indigestible to the soil-borne pathogens, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Alternaria, Verticillium. If you ever heard of any of these diseases, they are the easiest ones to get rid of the easiest ones to get rid of. They can only digest simple sugars, they can't digest carbohydrates, and so a basic level of health in your plant gives you full, complete resistance to these diseases. It's very exciting. Um, the next one is complete proteins. Um, larval forms of insects can digest amino acids, they can digest um, uh, nitrates, they cannot digest complete protein. Physiologically, they don't have the compound in their gut to digest complete protein. Um, it's like you eating a bale of hay. So. I've got written cabbage looper, tomato hornworm, corn earworm, Colorado potato beetle, but basically the larval forms of insects don't have the capacity to digest protein, and so as your plant begins to build complete proteins, it becomes indigestible. I grew up on a farm where we had Colorado potato beetles, and we would hit, take buckets every two days and knock the potato bugs into the buckets. We chickens wouldn't even eat them. We had to throw them in the fire or in the, down the, you know, put them in the toilet and flush them. There's too many. They're just, ugh. chickens are like, yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> we're not interested. Um, lipids, uh, fats and oils, uh, high levels of fats and oils um, will give your plant resistance to the mildews and blights, powdery mildew, downy mildew, uh, fire blight, late blight. Um, and finally, the secondary metabolites, those compounds which correlate with flavor and aroma, the most complicated compounds, are not digestible to uh, the adult forms of insects, the beetles. So. Um, my understanding is that only when your plant is indigestible to all these pathogens is it fit for you to eat, or is it fit for one of your customers to eat, or is it fit for your children to eat. If it's insect food, it's insect food. If it's fungus food, it's fungus food. If it's bacterium food, it's bacterium food only when it's animal food is an animal food. So if you've got voles and moles and mice and raccoons and deer eating your crops, you are growing food for animals. If you've got fungus and insects and bacteria eating your crops, 
you are not growing food for animals, you should not ethically be selling it or feeding it to your family. Full stop. You know, there was that craze about doing all the baby lettuces and baby yeah. this and baby mm -hmm. that. At the baby stage, do they have time to get all the way to this liquid yes. essential oil? They do. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No, I, um, I grow a lot of those baby greens. And um, arugula is one of those plants that loves to get eaten by flea beetles. I'm not sure if anyone knows what flea beetles are. Um, flea beetles, yes? Anybody grow in Brassica? <laughs> um, if I don't keep my seeds moist between planting and germination, I will get flea beetles. They will eat my arugula. If I do keep my seeds moist between planting and germination, that seems to be like I do everything else right, but sometimes the soil dries out between when I plant them and then when they germinate. Um, so I can have three beds of arugula that got dried out when it was planted, and there's flea beetles all over them, and I'll have three beds of arugula right next to them, untouched. I don't use Remay, I call that cheating. I mean, all people do use like flexible row covers to keep the insects away. Um, it's good for keeping the soil, the plants warmer as far as I'm concerned, but um, if you have to spray or any other way kill an insect or a disease, you are fighting nature's report card which is telling you you're not growing something that's fit for animals to eat. Only when animals are eating your crops, as far as I'm concerned, are you growing food for animals. Um, anyway, I will, this is on the agenda for tomorrow too to discuss. It's on the handout so we can bring it up more tomorrow. Um, fertigation, irrigation, this is really more for homework. Um, the idea is that you want to be able to maintain hydration through the growing season and if you don't have any other way of doing it, establishing some sort of an irrigation system is probably a good idea. Um, and then foliar spraying, and, and if you do have an irrigation system, you can feed your plants through the irrigation system, which is um, the kind of cheating that I support. Um, which is, yeah, means you can get good results without knowing what you're doing. Um, and foliar spraying is similar. Uh, that is to spray things onto the foliage. Um, people are maybe familiar with backpack sprayers or sort of the pump action backpack sprayers or boom sprayers. I use what's called a mist blower, which is a... a um, a, uh, a leaf blower with a tank on top. You know what leaf blowers are? Leaf blowers. I've got a leaf blower with a tank on top. It's called a mist blower. I can spray the back of this room right here, right now, from this, from from right here. I just amble like this, and brrr, turn around, and do half an acre in like ten minutes. It's great. No short sprays. We'll definitely be talking about tomorrow. Yes. Um, minerals, biology, um, seawater, trace elements, you know, um, inoculants, uh, essential oils, um, all kinds of goodies you can put in there. All kinds of goodies. Yeah. Uh, do you have the one that has like the mm. suction too? Yeah. It just, you can just suck You can fill the tank while the tank's on your back if you got a bucket. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can do a lot of acreage with in very little time. The pump action backpack sprayers, I. They really piss me off. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but my elbow gets sore yeah. way too fast, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, you're like, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. I got better things to do with myself. I just don't like doing this. So, um, we have a wand that um, you can hook to the like, um, garden hose yeah. and our egg pump, and like yeah. you can spray different patterns that you can. Spray the back wall and straight if you're getting trees and stuff, and you can yeah. make a mist, or it, it's very nice. Yeah. So we can put a tank of stuff, like a big tote, and then just walk around with a hose. And yeah. There's technology out there. You can use a paint sprayer. You can put a root injector down into Yeah. Tree. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with feeding your plants. So um, the idea is that, you know, getting access to this technology, experimenting, looking into it, it might be a good idea. So. Um, we'll talk how to use it tomorrow and what, the, and what, you, what you're using, what you're putting into it tomorrow. Um, and then finally, your homework between now and tomorrow um, is to establish your beds where you don't need to be doing much tillage. Um, get your soil covered. If you haven't covered it already, apply your minerals and establish cover crops. That's not true. This is for if it was a fall workshop. And not get your inoculants. Find the biggest seed you can get. Work on improving your potting soil. Get your foliar and fertigation infrastructure in place and read books and read 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 so all right that's it for today